Good afternoon to everybody. Last presentation for the conference. Uh, I would like, before to start with my intervention, to uh, first of all, the council mention to thank the Ministry of Agriculture and Finland for the invitation to be here, and also to Sefra for the organizational work and all the logistics and the support uh, within uh, the last couple of weeks. I have to say I was quite pleased uh, to be here to listen to the discussions. Uh, I saw many people who were proud of uh, what they have done over the last years in their uh, areas, in their communities, uh, in the way it was done. Uh, many mentioned uh, the difficulties in finding the right, uh, let's say, tone for dialogue between the different stakeholders, uh, between authorities and businessmen and local people. However, uh, unfortunately, not many uh, discussed with us the ways, uh, the way in which they managed to overcome this difficulty. Uh, but I understand that because I think when you are proud of your work, it is also important to show what you have done and how uh, you have done it. I will unfortunately not be able to present such <laughs> nice photos like uh, many of you did, uh, because as policy makers, uh, my job uh, does not allow me to participate uh, actively in, in project development. I'm working in Director General for Agriculture and Rural Development in the unit coordinating the rural development policy. Over the last seven years, I was responsible for access free of the rural development policy. Uh, recently, I have focused mostly on business development in rural areas financial instruments, uh, growth on ICT, employment and growth elements. Uh, I have to say, however, that uh, we do our best uh, to stay as close as possible with the stakeholders, with the developments in Europe. Uh, that's why I was quite pleased to, to hear examples from uh, Europe, from European countries. Uh, I understand, as a former academic, uh, the attempts and the emphasis which is placed on developing countries. Uh, it is also a very nice area for doing uh, research and, and finding conclusions, testing things. However, often it is very difficult to directly extrapolate approaches and uh, methodologies applied there into the European context. It is almost impossible to introduce this into uh, a legal context. So I think. From our perspective, uh, we try to stay within the borders of Europe. Of course, we learn from foreign experience. We try to catch up economies which are much more developed. But still, when it comes to the legislation, the policy framework for the support, we try to learn from what we've done wrongly in the current program periods or in the previous ones to see, to get idea, generate ideas how we can improve and move things forward. My objective today will be to present you the new framework, basically what will be possible to be supported from our fund in relation to tourism. I will not uh, focus that much on the different types of beneficiaries, whether local authorities or private entities or uh, local action groups. I think you can figure out by yourself uh, what will fit best in your ideas or in um, your strategies or proposals for the future. I will try to also speak a little bit on the lessons that we have learned from programming point of view, maybe a little bit from business point of view, uh, in the context of the good practices that we have collected. And at the end, although I'm not a person dealing directly with leader, uh, I will try to present to you uh, the new concept for, for leader with its advantages. Uh, and I hope with this uh, to form a nice it's a relatively interesting presentation followed by uh, certain discussions. If there are questions on which I cannot answer immediately, I'll be happy to take them to Brussels and ask colleagues to answer. Uh, so if this is the case, uh, please leave me your uh, contact details afterwards. So, uh, yeah. so I said I don't have nice photos. That's the only one I can offer to you. This is from our statistical report. Uh, we will have an updated figure in a couple of months when the new data is released. Uh, I hope you understand that when it comes to data indicators at EU level, um, 
we have to work with official data also collected through Eurostat. Uh, we have quite limited opportunities. What you see here is the concentration of the places across Europe and with the different green or uh, red dots whether there is a positive or respectively negative growth in these regions. Uh, absolute growth in, in terms of bad places. What you cannot see from the figure, of course, is the quality of the service. I think the fact that you have a higher concentration in certain areas, and obviously mass tourism areas are covered, does not necessarily mean that the quality that you get there, or the feeling as tourists receive there, or the way local people feel is also at the highest, or it is the lowest, depending on how things have evolved over the last years. What is very important, however, for me is that what we have also seen from our good practices uh, that projects and emphasis has been put, especially in terms of a conceptual development uh, supported not only by our fund but also by, our, but by, by other funds in areas where there has been a kind of decline where nothing has happened in, let's say, recent years or what has been there somehow starts to um, fade away or to uh, experience a bit of difficulties in its development. This does not mean that the EU support should focus only on such areas. It goes, of course, to areas where there is a positive growth developments, but uh, when it comes to good practices, I think uh, such territories present uh, a very good opportunity for policy makers, uh, politicians and entrepreneurs uh, in terms of development. Very quickly on the statistics, uh, as you have seen, uh, probably you saw already, there is quite a unique distribution. We have concentration of bad places in uh, a few member states. However, what is important is that we see positive growth in almost two thirds of the member states. Uh, Croatia is not covered, you know, the country joined already the European Union. However, in terms of data coverage, 2012 is not a year which uh, can represent. Uh, there are countries which are currently experiencing quite a high growth and they're developing themselves, uh, especially with the new member states. The others who are already there, who already have developed uh, concepts, brands, images uh, such as France, Germany, or Austria. However, as we are talking about an economic development which is dynamic and we have different financial cycles there is always an opportunity for improving what is offered to uh, tourists. Now, what we have learned, we've done a study a uh, few years ago on employment growth and innovation in rural areas. Based on the study, we produced a working document uh, which analyzed all the good practices that were collected. All this is available on the website of DigiAgri. Uh, I think it's also at the end of my presentation. What was obvious and it's very clear to us, it is that tourism is one of the two major sectors in rural areas, uh, together with agriculture and forestry. Uh, if you look financially in the current programming period, we are spending more than uh, 3 billion euro uh, for supporting tourism in rural areas. Additional funds are spent under leader. Uh, however, what has also been uh, pointed out based on this study and the surveys that were done in, in various parts of Europe is that uh, high quality tourism goes with natural resources and environmental quality. So those two elements are quite crucial for those that want to develop uh, a concept, uh, a key uh, tourism sector in their regions and want to sustain this for the years to come. However, there are very there are many barriers to growth. Uh, it's a dynamic model, it is difficult to isolate, and even if you isolate, you will still commit something. It's difficult to develop even economic models. However, uh, what has been also shown is that uh, regional authorities play a central role. And uh, I think for us, uh, it is very clear that if there is no commitment, if there is no political commitment, if there is no transferability between the different uh, let's say, uh, election cycles and uh, people who come into power, uh, then it will be, it is very difficult for an area to sustain a certain development or to progress into development. Uh, what we have also seen based on these practices, 
an example is that the most difficult part for regional <coughs> authorities uh, have been to find the correct partnership. Uh, on the one hand, we, we have this initiative element on how to involve uh, local people, businesses into partnerships, how to stimulate also local authorities to be more open-minded, uh, accept the ideas of the local people. But finding the correct partnership is quite important. Why? Because in regions where there were concepts and strategies based on which funding was done, carried over, and then there was a, a regional image created and a branding, uh, this has evolved into the creation of different standards, regional standards, which need to be uh, sustained and maintained and followed by everybody who wants to benefit from them. And this partnership, which initially could be only uh, in the context of uh, idea development or conceptual development, strategic development, further evolve in a joint ventures for marketing purposes, uh, and then the combination and uh, the role which uh, each partner plays in this partnership is, is quite important. And I'm talking here about strategies that were developed for a period of 10 to 20 years. I'm not talking about activities for uh, one, two or three years, uh, which can benefit from short-term support. Now, in the current programming period, uh, we have a specific measure on rural development. It has those three major objectives and, let's say, support elements. However, uh, what we have seen, at least in the programs, uh, was that uh, operations were listed in a quite a random way. Uh, obviously, the road development programs are more global documents, uh, it's, but then still there was a kind of missing linkage with uh, certain concept strategies that could be developed. Uh, however, we've seen that uh, marketing promotion and IT applications were widely uh, supported and eight intensities were used to stimulate certain type of development and activities. There was, however, a rare focus on development of specific types of tourism. There was a lot of listing of different types of tourism, everything which is possible, but it was difficult to see even when it comes to eight intensities or support selection criteria, which form of tourism <laughs> could predominate or is important for a certain region or programming area. There was also, uh, which was for me a bit surprising, but maybe it was because of the approach which we had in terms of setting separate measures with separate financial plans that need different accreditation, etc. It was rarely uh, seen an integrated approach linking the support which we had under the tourism measure with the cultural heritage or the natural heritage. Normally these were uh, two separate flows in terms of programming and uh, later on in terms of implementation, in terms of course of tender and project application and support for projects. Maybe it is different under leader. Uh, because leader is much more open, but uh, when it comes to the top-down approach, uh, rarely we had a managing authorities which really went forward in grouping these measures together and trying to deliver uh, something more uh, bigger as project and, and impacts. Innovation was rarely used as a selection criterion, maybe because sometimes it is difficult to define what is innovative and what is not innovative. Uh, we have seen also tendency to uh, link rural tourism only with rural accommodation and I was extremely glad to hear today that this is no longer the case. I was also happy to hear that uh, when it comes to uh, community-based tourism, whatever this concept means, uh, the interests of the community are put in the front in the first place and not vice versa, not that the community has to adjust to the tourist flows in order to satisfy a certain tourists. I think there are so many tourists in Europe that in principle if there is a well-defined concept and there is a tr transparency and there is a desire from the community to show the way it lives and the way it functions and, and, and with the events it is proud then definitely there will be uh, a demand. Uh, we think that there is a need of a better alignment with the different strategies uh, that are existing at local or regional level uh, and at the same time which is a problem and uh, we try to as much as possible 
uh, keeping in mind that we are implementing the policy under shared management, so it is always to the governments or regional authorities to define how things function. But uh, we've noticed that sometimes the application process lasts very long. It is sometimes longer than it takes for a project to happen. Uh, this, of course, is a burden for innovation. It, is, it could be annoying for entrepreneurs who want quickly to invest in something, not to miss a season or two seasons in order to see their project happening. Uh, so the average period between submission of application and signing of contract uh, for tourism purposes based on the good practices we've collected is between seven and nine months, but we have some cases where this has happened up to two years uh, and the problem was the involvement of uh, capital which is difficult to evaluate. So I think it's much easier for authorities to go for investment type of projects where it is clear what will be built, but when it comes to more complicated, comprehensive projects then the evaluation process takes longer. Now on the new policy, I'm not going to stay longer on this slide, this simply presents um, the common agricultural policy, how it will look like uh, through uh, Europe 2020 objectives. We are going to talk about Pure 2, uh, where the tourism support is placed. Uh, and Pure 2 can also support the European Venture Partnership. However, the EEP is mostly agriculturally oriented, so I would find it difficult for the time being to see a uh, kind of direct link, linkage between it and tourism. Now, what kind of activities can we support, and are, what are we going to uh, support? Uh, everything which is here I will talk a little bit further, so I'm not going to read it out. Uh, we maintain, I think, in terms of legal proposals and legal text and possibilities, we are going to have the best legislation in the last 20 years. Uh, for the moment we are at the end of the negotiation phase, hopefully somewhere in October and November the legislation will be settled down, then we have to elaborate the delegated implementing acts, but uh, the objective is very clear, we want to have everything in place by the beginning of next year. I think we kept the charm and the romantics of the policy, and if you look into the other policies, uh, I think we are the most romantic amongst them. We really go to the beneficiary down to very small scale things which at first glance think uh, may look a bit uh, unnecessary, but uh, they bring a lot of Evaluated, which is not possible to be simply estimated or put in a figure. Uh, what is important is that we keep the rural area dimension. I think for our fund this is essential. Uh, we don't support also as a matter of principle mass tourism things, uh, but it's up to the managing authorities normally member states to define how far in terms of rural area dimension the fund can go. And we have maintained leader with a new approach, common approach with the other funds. What has happened recently is that uh, in the context of the negotiation it was added uh, a new text which existed previously but for certain reasons uh, it was taken out. Basically the marketing of tourism services uh, when it comes to cooperation projects and development of projects of at least two entities. Very little on the innovation side and the different support elements. As you see on the figure, in principle we will have two, two options for support. So the grant support which is basic, it is there, it stays there. We try a lot in the last years to stimulate the setting up of financial instruments. For those who are not familiar, this is these are credit funds or guarantee funds or uh, equity based funds that can be created in a given program area that can further stimulate and ensure the funding uh, that is missing in the market. Uh, such activities can be developed by the managing authorities, uh, can even loan and guarantee funds be provided by the managing authorities themselves. Uh, they can of course also rely on EU level financial instruments, they can appoint the European Investment Bank as a manager or advisor for these instruments. But I think the crucial point is that we have now taken a bit uh, the emphasis from the private entities and we have 
placed it a bit on the public-private partnerships and the cooperational activities. And I think as a concept and as a framework, uh, we have managed to elaborate it as much as possible. Now, what will happen in the different programming areas, that's a different question. Because it is possible managing authorities to limit measures. It is possible managing authorities to limit beneficiaries or support the beneficiaries. This is something which depends entirely on, on their perception of how things should function in their rural areas. Interestingly enough, we do support, now we provide uh, support for networking activities. We also provide support for clusters. Now clusters in tourism could be quite um, interesting, but maybe also difficult to develop. There is a need for a very strong regional specialization in order for this to happen, but it is not impossible. So all this is part of the framework, all this is there, and hopefully it will be used to the maximum by managing authorities. So I start with the first measure, which is probably the most interesting. It's about business development. We have grouped all the business support, which currently is under different measures, into one. And the new element there, on which I would like to stress, is the start of aid. So we have now the possibility uh, to provide startup aid for any business in the rural area that starts a new activity. The startup aid doesn't cover only investment costs. It can cover running costs, uh, any type of costs, marketing costs, any type of costs that the business uh, would need in order to uh, become operational. Uh, of course, it is up to the managing authority to define the maximum level of support. It cannot be beyond 70,000 euro per beneficiary. At the same time, uh, this support can be also linked with support that can be given for uh, non-agricultural investments. Uh, we have opened up the support to all farmers. Previously, it was only limited to farm farmers in rural areas. Now, every farmer and his household members can develop non-agricultural activities, no matter whether these are located, for example, in Kotka, Helsinki, or somewhere in the countryside. Uh, and we have tried to ease a bit the payments. So basically, there is an opportunity we start up aid to be received in at least two installments. But the business plan which has to be submitted is a very essential point. So I think uh, this is the crucial element and what we have seen from the good practices is that if you don't have a solid business plan, uh, it is difficult to expect uh, a huge impact or a successful project to be developed. We have also enlarged the support to cover small enterprises. I think this is quite a major step for us. Uh, previously, when it comes to non-agricultural businesses, everyone was talking only about micro-enterprises. Currently, we enlarge this to cover micro and small. At the same time, we kept everything which we had linked to natural and cultural heritage. All the support options are there. We do provide support for any type of infrastructure, but of small scale, and small scale has to be defined by the member states except for broadband and renewable energy. Uh, we also support the development of village development plans or municipality development plans or their upgrading. And normally, in the next programming period, and this is in the legal text, we would like to see projects which somehow are linked with this uh, municipality development plans. Just don't confuse this with leader. Leader is a different thing. We will come this. Uh, we will come to this a bit later. We are talking here about uh, a top-down approach where managing authorities define what should be in the measures. They launch the call for tenders, they collect projects, evaluate, and uh, they pay them. We have a new measure which is called cooperation, which will be uh, available for any project that involves at least two entities. So the cooperation is left open. Whether you have farmers, whether you have private businesses, whether you have uh, inter interbranch organizations or local public bodies, public-private partnership, everything normally can fit within the concept of the measure. It covers extremely various types of projects, including pilot projects. Uh, 
what the change which I mentioned about the marketing of tourism services related to tourism was introduced clearly in the legal text. So there is no doubt anymore whether this can be funded or cannot be funded. Like I said, it is possible also to receive funding for networking, uh, for clusters, and we cover different types of costs. And I think this is quite important because we can cover animation costs, we can cover running costs, uh, we can cover costs for testing of specific projects linked to local development strategies, different from uh, the leader strategies. So I think overall, uh, it, from EU point of view, uh, there is quite a diversity uh, of the support options which are given to the member states and it is now up to them to develop them further. We do of course uh, maintain the training options and uh, advisory services. We have released the restrictions which currently exist. For example, there was a restriction on the number of advice the beneficiary can get. We've opened this up. There is no restriction anymore and further to this we can provide support uh, for uh, those who provide uh, advice to train their personnel. The support is limited to 200,000 of euro per uh, three years, so I think this is quite a significant amount of money, especially for uh, some member states which have which economic development is not that advanced. And it can give quite an opportunity for exchange of practices and knowledge on, on different matters and which later on it would be really nice to see this uh, impacting on, on, on projects and impacts of projects. We can now support even demonstration projects with all the investment costs which are linked. Uh, we have created possibilities for exchange programs of farmers and forestry holders. So uh, we have maintained what we had but we tried to elaborate it, increase it uh, give an opportunity for exchange of information and practices and uh, potentially see innovation flowing through in a better way through the rural areas. Now this slide a bit lists what we've seen in some programs linked to rural heritage and tourism. This is not an exhaustive list, it's a very short thing. We have many other slides but I didn't really found it necessary to to put everything uh, listed like that, but you see in the different member states there is different approaches, however sometimes there is uh, the same focus on let's say built heritage conservation or uh, preservation of different uh, assets like uh, music, folklore, etc. Elements which are of quite crucial importance when we talk about communities and the way people live in, in their areas. Now, what do we need uh, for boosting uh, niche development and rural tourism? I said it you know, before, I will repeat myself, we would really like to see a more integrated approach. Uh, projects which are more comprehensive, uh, projects that cover uh, different aspects which are developed at once and not bit by bit uh, with different stages that take years of funding and waiting and can be quite discouraging. Uh, we think that there is a need of targeting at local level, whether through eight intensities or selection criteria or specific measures of measures. This is the choice of the member states. We would like to see more better integration of local products into tourism development concept. Uh, I'm placing the emphasis on farmers and what they are doing for uh, local areas, not only in terms of food but also in terms of provision of different services. And uh, what we would like to see is a kind of transferability. I think this is extremely important that we don't have projects which are only sustained within the period of funding, but that these projects uh, can later on keep on running, uh, maybe of a smaller scale, but still to be there uh, and to provide uh, profits and benefits to the local community. Now switching to leader, uh, like I said, we have a new approach, uh, which basically means that we have the same rules for the community locally, local led development for all uh, structural investment funds. Uh, the concept more or less stays the same like leader, of course we are the ones uh, that give the best example. Uh, 
there are, there are local action groups under the fishery fund, but they don't have the scale, skill, and uh, experience which is uh, existent under leader. Uh, it is still should be led by local communities based on uh, local development strategies. However, uh, we offer now the possibility for an integrated approach, for a multi-fund approach, for having a lead fund, something which didn't exist in the moment and sometimes during conferences or meetings it has been uh, presented as a kind of a difficulty on the side of the stakeholders. The different types of support probably is not new for those of you who are involved in, in leader. Uh, we do cover again running costs, animation costs, uh, we cover preparation and implementation of cooperation activities of the various local action groups. Of course, we pay for projects uh, that will be selected by the LACs, and uh, we have also the preparatory support. What are the advantages? The advantages is that when you develop a territory, you need to look globally, you need to look at all elements, all aspects. Now, I understand that we still have the different funds and the, there is a need of defining in the partnership agreements which fund where we will intervene, but still at local level the strategy is one. You have one idea, one target, you have to reach it. What you try to do is to get different funding from different sources in order to reach it and we try to simplify this by offering the option for a common methodology, for a common local development strategies, multi-fund approach, where there might be joint uh, call for tenders. So basically, all the projects that need to start at the same time, they start at the same time. And there is no waiting in months and years for one or another fund to adjust its content and uh, its implementation in order to reflect the local strategy. That's a bit However, a complicated approach. Why? Because um, what needs to be there also is a kind of cooperation between different managing authorities at national or regional level. And that's a bit of burden. This is something that has to be overcome. Uh, in some countries it functions perfectly, in others it doesn't function at all. Uh, but that's the task of the member states to find the best way how they can work together in order to help um, their territories. We have very high co-financing rates, up to 80% in other regions and 90% in less developed regions. And in rural development, we maintain the 5% uh, requirement for uh, funding for leader. I have to admit that once you put a minimum requirement, it suddenly turns into a maximum. It is like with the agricultural prices. Uh, in the past, there were a lot of interventions when uh, governments, authorities wanted to regulate the, the market and to ensure a decent income, setting a minimum price. Once you set a minimum price, it becomes a maximum. That's how the market reacts. That's what we have seen with leader in the current period. But I think it's important to maintain at least this 5% because uh, if we release it, there is a risk that in certain territories, uh, regions, and member states, this funding will be much lower. So the groups which are now starting, they will basically be stopped in their development and completely discouraged. Very quickly on a multi-fund approach. This is the idea with one local strategy, different funds, different projects, one local action group, or let's say joint local action groups, uh, one selection process, and a more streamlined implementation. Uh, a little bit uh, on the lead fund option. This is a possibility for a certain fund to cover the uh, running costs. Uh, it should be decided by the local action group whether this is needed or not and how it should be defined. Uh, however, when it comes to uh, multi-fund, the managing authorities should allocate the budgets from each of the funds that will uh, be part of this multi-fund approach and local action group should indicate in the financial plan the plant actions and resources from each fund. Finally, a bit on the lessons learned. I think the weakest point, at least for what I've heard from colleagues, uh, I haven't looked deeply into this, are the local development strategies. Uh, the content of some of the strategies needs, at least from what we have seen, is to be considerably improved. The more concrete the strategies are, 
the better for the local action group and the easier will be to reach uh, targets. Of course, there is a need of linkages between strategies at local level and strategies at national or regional level. This is very clear. But I think uh, people know what they want for their areas, they know what they want to develop. And if there is the right uh, experience in consultancy, normally uh, it should not be a problem to uh, release very concrete actions that should take place in the area. The way forward, uh, focus on animation, capacity building, uh, strengthening the participation of the private sector in the partnerships. You know we changed the distribution. Now local authorities can have maximum 49%. However, a decision to be taken will need at least 50% of the votes and the majority should be from social partners. Uh, we do think about the reinforced networking between local action groups at different levels and stimulating the transnational cooperation which currently happens on in certain parts of Europe. So this is for me. Thank you very much for the attention and some useful links at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much uh, Nivelin for your for your excellent presentation. Uh, this target that you are going to write a best legislation ever, it's, it's really supportive and, and but the, I think that the challenge is that uh, the different legislations, uh, for instance this horizontal regulation and what comes to, to control issues and, and so on, that they are all going to the same direction so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. Uh, but now we have an excellent opportunity to ask, to ask send comments to the Commission and ask very uh, difficult questions and also easy questions. What would you like to ask? Please. Thank you very much. It was really very nice and interesting uh, presentation especially talking about the vision of uh, 20 and 20. The, 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 the question that I have is just related to the presentation of uh, uh, one of the researchers who uh, was talking about uh, Portugal. And I would like uh, just you have your evaluation from her presentation. Because you know, having such kind of a uh, good vision, uh, I'm sure that the EU trying to give the uh, opportunity to the countries just to find the way and uh, uh, to establish activities on the basis of uh, the uh, rural uh, tourism activities and to help the communities uh, just to survive and to improve the welfare, to improve the quality of life and the standard of the life. So uh, this is really very helpful if you give your, your ideas in this regard. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, I listened to the presentation which was in the part of the session. I think part of the audience was not there. So I'm not going to comment on the presentation or what was said. I think the emphasis was that there was no benefit for the local people from certain tourism developments. Now, I said it in the beginning, we should distinguish between mass tourism and between, let's say, um, rural tourism, because the concept of rural tourism has evolved over years. Uh, a very good friend of mine, who is also a colleague of mine, uh, he brought me a book a couple of weeks ago, and this book, I started laughing when I saw the title, because we were talking also about this conference. It was about rural tourism and sustainable rural development. And apparently it was the proceedings from a conference that took place in 1993 in Ireland, where even the example of Sweden was presented. So the concepts are there, the basics are there, the, the major things are there. And for 20 years, of course, there is an evolution, there is a development, but the basic is there. I think everyone has to take its responsibility when it comes to development of projects or involvement of uh, the community or the people into uh, the territorial development. 
we implement the policy in a shared management, which means that we need such a legislation that can adapt can be adaptable, adjustable to any situation in the European Union, and you see situations are quite different. Uh, if there are parts of territories which were left isolated, or people feel uh, not, uh, let's say, part of the processes that are happening in their area, I think the attention should not be towards the Commission or the Union as such, it should be towards the local authorities, the regional authorities. Uh, they should be the ones who have to give answers to the people why something is happening in their area, uh, what will be the impact for the area, who is doing it, why is doing it, is there an EU support involved or not, why a certain person is not benefiting from it, I don't know what would be the reason, um, what is meant by benefit also is quite important, etc. Et uh, if you talk about agritourism, I think this is one in Portugal, it's, it's, it's quite well developed, it's even improving. Uh, I can talk about greenways, for example. And actually, tomorrow in Portugal will be the awards ceremony for uh, the Greenway Awards uh, for 2012. And I think uh, there are a lot of uh, things which are happening on the ground. It is possible to have a village or villages which remain isolated, uh, but then the interaction and the relationship between the people and the local authorities has to improve. If people in these villages feel completely outside the development of the region. Uh, and we have provided various tools. I mean, in terms of support, everything is there. But how things function locally, it's up to the member states to define. It's difficult for me to give an advice, to give a concrete recommendation, uh, keeping also in mind that what was presented was just statistical relationship between qualitative and quantitative findings in free villages. So, I would like to stop here. Uh, I suppose there might be a lot of discussions, and maybe some people from the audience can actually give better answers than you. There are some on the list. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Somebody who wants to uh, develop together 
separate activities like uh, investments in physical assets, together with training, exchange of experience, um, networking cooperation, they can do it at once. If the member state is willing to allow it, or the regional authorities, depending whether we have regional or national program. If they allow it, then the impact will be there. If the approach remains the same as it is now, then maybe it will be a bit difficult. And maybe for leader I should say that there are two options. The one option is to follow what we have in the different measures with eligibility, etc. Uh, to have this approach which will be much more burdensome or to release leader and, and, and let it you know, start or continue on a completely different basis. So these are the two options. Of course, it's also a question of control, um, a question of clarity, of um, maybe security even for authorities. Um, it is true that our control is quite complex, but at the same time we are spending even money, so we cannot just give the money and forget about it. So I think there is, we are still in a phase where member states are thinking. I'm sure they know what they want to a certain extent. And maybe the interactions with the stakeholders will play quite a crucial role in, in setting up. Uh, and as we are in a quite a dynamic situation, we can also have cases where member states start from point A, but if it's not working or it's difficult, they can always modify the approach and make it easier. This is also much. Okay, uh, one more. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the first question I just want to be certain that I didn't misunderstand anything. You are sure that the lag is going to be continued in the local areas? That's the first question. And the other one was the areas in the individual countries. Is it the countries deciding what, how big they are going to be in the new lag? Or is it something that is going to be told? And then there is another one. And I didn't think I got what I understood was going to happen to the lag fish, the flag. Um, With the fishery lags. The flag, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and could you say something about the timetable? When, when, when are we ready to, to start working again in the new program? We. We don't work on the program. No, no. Uh, out, 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 out in the country. Yeah. Uh, the countries. Okay. Uh, I start from the last question because it's easier. <laughs> so, like I said, we should have the last three logs in September, possibly in October. Uh, I would expect by November the legislation to be there. Uh, we are working simultaneously on the delegated implementing acts. For the implementing acts, it will take a bit of time to be in place, but let's say by the beginning of next year, everything should be there. Member states normally, uh, some are advanced, others are not, uh, but they can start submitting their programs from 1st of January 2014. How fast it will go, I don't know. It depends, we can be, we have procedural time which is necessary to evaluate the content. Uh, there is a lot of bilateral interactions, but some member states are quicker than others. Regions are, some regions are quicker than others. It is difficult to predict. Uh, I don't personally expect, this is only my personal opinion, that we will have road development programs in place before March. You have to think also about national legislation, you have to think about accreditation, we need to think about the control rules which should be put in place. So, to be on the safe side, I would say summer next year, I would see more or less members, some member states already starting implementing. Now, we do have also transitional measures. We also, it is also possible for the member states once they submit the road development programs to start implementing certain supporting certain operations, it is on their own risk, but if we talk about, let's say, environmental payments where we have an annual duration of going from one programming period to another, uh, it is possible to continue under certain conditions, it all depends also on the contracting uh, that will be made, but again, uh, I think 
March, April would be the first months when we can see some programs approved. It also depends how quickly a member state can react to the comments that we will do. And at present, as far as I know, partnership agreements are under discussion. Uh, more or less every member state is working on this. So we need first to have the partnership agreements in place. They will decide to great extent which fund, how it will support community let local development, in what territories it will intervene. Uh, for fisheries, I think the flags, they will remain. Of course, there will be a new process in terms of recognition of local Asian groups, uh, improvement of strategies, um, maybe a new content of strategies or elaborated content from what it was already there. Member states have to define uh, the context, but I think Sana can very quickly explain how it will work for Finland on this point, also because I'm not involved uh, that much of leader. But there will be a new process in terms of recognition. And when it comes to the multi-fund approach, from what I've seen is that we would like to have, you need also to have a critical mass. Uh, and uh, what colleagues were discussed, there will be a guidance document that will be produced. Uh, they were talking about territories covering between 10,000 and 150,000 people. Uh, because then you can cover also small towns or a bit bigger towns, you can have uh, better rural urban linkages or projects targeting this, etc. Uh, but please talk to Sana about the concrete details, especially because she's more uh, knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Very quickly, I would like to say that uh, in uh, the Finnish plan is that we are going to send the rural development program just after the legislation, the EU legislation has been uh, officially approved. So that means that we will send a, uh, a partnership agreement and the rural development program maybe in, in November or in, in December this year to, to the Commission. And we have also unofficially started the selection procedure of the local leader local development strategies. So I think that the, my op personal opinion is that we just have to continue with the development processes and of course keep in mind the legislation and, and so on, but uh, if we wait too long the train will go uh, too, too slowly forward. Thank you very much.